A new endeavor has been launched aimed at helping people talk about their wishes for end-of-life care. It's called The Conversation Project, and joining us now from Cambridge, Massachusetts, is co-founder and director Ellen Goodman. Ellen, we're recording this on the day after the launch of the project. How's it going after some 48 hours or so? Well, it's been wonderful. I mean, it's fulfilled all of our thoughts that we really are at a tipping point, that people are ready but reluctant to have these conversations and that they are um, really uh, engaged. We've had great outreach with the media, but also already a lot of people posting their stories and and telling us, filling in the blank that's on our web page uh, called uh, the blank says, I want mine to be, which is please tell us what your end of life wishes are. Um, and so we're, you know, pretty thrilled so far. Well, we should note the uh, the website uh, uh, address, and that is the conversation project dot org. And that's that's where, right. One yeah. word: the conversation project dot org. Right, and uh, a nice uh, 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 collaboration with uh, ABC News on this as well. That's right. We've really been lucky in partnering with ABC News. And so we're on the front page of their home page as well. This And uh, they have been amazingly interested in this project. Um, I think some years ago people would have said, oh, my goodness, you're talking about end of life? <laughs> <laughs> no, anything but that. And I think a major broadcaster like ABC might have been quite reluctant. But they were right from the get-go really interested in being our partners in changing the cultural norm, and that's what we're about. We're about changing the cultural norm from not talking about what you want with your family and loved ones to talking about it. Well, Ellen, you join an impressive group of people and organizations who have worked in this end-of-life arena. Why you in particular, and why now? Uh, There have been a lot of people who have worked in this field, and we come really grateful for all of the work that's been done. And yet at the same time when we had a meeting with experts some time ago, what they said to us is, you know, we've been working with doctors, we're working with caregivers, we've been working with hospitals, and what we really need to do is change the culture so that people have these conversations around the kitchen table. So we feel that our project will give lift to everything that's going on uh, and that has been going on in the wonderful work that's been done in palliative care and hospice care and end of life. Well, you mentioned that meeting, those meetings that began, uh, according to your website, some two years ago in, in 2010 when you began sharing stories of good deaths and bad deaths. What were some of the common themes that, that came from those early discussions? In our early discussions, we were just a small group of people. We were, you know, uh, media, medical people, uh, clergy, and we all took off our professional hats and told very deeply personal stories about good deaths and hard deaths. And the difference uh, seemed to be whether we knew what the people we love wanted at the end of their lives. The difference seemed to be uh, that difference was in how our loved ones died, whether they died the way they would choose or not, and also in the way survivors dealt with it at the end how guilty they felt, whether they were left with nagging doubts about whether they had made the right choices. We all, I think, hope to hear the voices of the people that we love in our minds when we have to make choices when they're no longer able to. And that is really crucial. And that's why we want these conversations to take place before it's too late. We want them to take place not in the ICU, not in the doctor's office even, but first at least around the kitchen table. Eventually you started collaborating with people like Meyer Christopher and John Carney at the Center for Practical Bioethics. That's one of those organizations that have quite a few years of experience and, and resources to, uh, to draw from there, right? I can't tell you how. Myra is my own personal guru in this. Yeah. <laughs> Myra's been absolutely wonderful. 
um, and a real supporter of the work that we have done. And the work that she and John have done in the center have, has done have just been crucial to uh, laying both the groundwork and also to uh, changing the way people uh, uh, die in a more humane way. And, and as I said, I think that our project comes along to give lift to the others. Um, we hope that everything that we do um, is a, a round of applause and a uh, hand up for the work that's been done already. The center and a number of other organizations have been promoting this type of conversation for years, and the, the percentage of people with an advanced directive stays stubbornly at around 27% or 30% or so. How will the conversation project start moving that needle higher? Well, I think we live in a different world now um, that the kind of retail work that we have all done, you know, family by family, uh, we now have a social media uh, world in which the capacity to pay it forward, to pass it on, um, to go viral, <laughs> uh, really can make cultural changes in a way that is uh, more powerful than in the past and maybe even less expensive than in the past. Because you remember that we used to have, you know, sort of vast uh, public service announcement proposals to get that were hugely expensive and that may move the needle on something like smoking. And now we have Facebook campaigns. I mean, the Conversation Project is on Facebook, it's on Twitter, it's on the web, um, as well as um, uh, having our broadcast partners uh, such a crucial part of the project. And I think that we're at a different time as well because we have um, we're in the midst of a longevity revolution and the baby boom generation which really ha uh, have been the social change agents of our culture all the way through their lives are now dealing with both their parents aging and dying and with themselves aging and um, we have, a, 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 as part of that generation, really been the talkers in society and the change agents. And so I think we're ready to tackle this next change that has come from the longevity revolution and also from uh, medical technology that we all value but recognize can make life harder. It seems that we as Americans pay attention to this issue around the controversial stories like the, the Terry Schiavo from a few years past and, and Nancy Cruzan uh, before that. And uh, then there's a spurt of activity and attention paid to this issue, and then it seems to go away. Is it fair to say that you're hoping the conversation project will make this more of a day-to-day -day type of endeavor? I think so. And, and you have to remember that we are story-based because everyone has a story. The Terry Schiavo story became a national issue, uh, but in fact, everybody has a story. It's been, to me as a journalist, it, one of the most remarkable things is I've never been involved in anything where you, people said, what are you doing? And you say, well, I'm working on uh, trying to get end of life wishes expressed and respected. And they, the next sentence is, let me tell you about what happened with my mother, with my father, with my husband, wife whatever. Um, so when you get that that wedge of people who have stories to tell and you start telling them, those individual stories add up to even more than a Terry Schiavo. Where do you hope this endeavor will be uh, a year from now or, or five years from now? Well, I hope that um, a year from now, two, three, whatever it takes, uh, when people say to each other, have you had the conversation, they'll know what that means and that people, it will no longer be a taboo. Remember that a generation ago, people were still whispering the word cancer and now they're saying erectile dysfunction in public. And I think if we can talk about uh, end of life wishes um, in a easy and humane way, it can make a phenomenal difference in the way we do, in fact, end our lives and those of the people we love. 
Alan Goodman is a Pulitzer Prize winning, uh, winning columnist and the co-founder and director of The Conversation Project. You can find out more at their website, theconversationproject.org. Ellen, thanks for your time. Good luck. Thank you. I'm Lorella Boo. Thanks for listening to the Bioethics Channel.